If you can go ahead and introduce yourself, let us know who you are and what you do. Sure. I, I'm an ordained Methodist minister, and I have been uh, teaching at Asbury Seminary for the last um, 26 years. Wow. And before that, I taught at Ashland Seminary in Ohio. Before that, I taught at Duke Divinity School in Vanderbilt. So it's been a long while. Uh, before that, I pastored six churches. Oh, wow. And uh, is that all over the country? Uh, no. Well, I'm from North Carolina, so all the churches were in North Carolina. I'm ordained in the uh, North Carolina conferences. Of okay. The church. Yeah. So um, if you don't mind just going ahead and, you know, uh, you know, we're here to talk about classical Arminianism, but you're also uh, Wesleyan too. So if you could just explain, you know, what classical Arminianism is and, you know, add in, in uh, also, you know, your uh, definition of Wesleyan and, uh, you know, how that relates to that as well. Well, classical, first of all, Jacob Arminius, for whom the name Arminian comes, was in fact a Dutch Calvinist who had problems with some of Dutch Calvinism. And so basically, if you're actually a student of Jacob Arminius, and I'd recommend Keith Stanglin's book on him, hmm. the truth of the matter is he's a modified Calvinist. He's not really what today we mean by an Arminian. So that's point number one. So when we talk about Arminians today, we're talking about a broad scope of uh, denominations, including the Salvation Army, various Pentecostal denominations, the Assemblies of God, the Church of God, the Church of God of the Prophecy, the AME Zion Methodists, the um, United Methodists, the Free Methodists, etc., the British Methodists, you name it. It's a very large group of people. In fact, it's a much larger group of people than any of the Calvinist denominations. Hmm. For example, uh, already 3,000 United Methodist churches have disaffiliated from the United Methodist Church. That's more than the total number of Presbyterian churches in the PCA wow. or the UPUSA. So we're talking about a large group of people in a large family of denominations that share in common that they are not Calvinists, and they're also not Lutherans. I mean, there's both Lutheran Reformed traditions and Calvinist Reformed traditions, and uh, Arminians, as they're known today, or uh, or more narrowly, Wesleyans, are neither of those. So uh, what's the difference? Well, let's just take the, the basic tulip of Calvinism, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, um, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. That's the big five of traditional Calvinism. Mm -hmm. And basically, Jacob Arminius um, had reservations on two of those. The main one was he thought that the atoning death of Christ was for everyone. It was not just, uh, Christ didn't just die for the elect. So uh, how do Wesleyans differ? Well. Uh, Wesleyans, first of all, would agree, and John Wesley himself would agree, with the notion that human fallenness is such that all human beings are in the bondage to sin. However, uh, Wesleyans would also say that God is gracious towards all of his creatures, and there is such a thing as prevenient grace, a grace that's given to everyone. Um, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, however old they may be, so that they are enabled by grace to respond to the call of the gospel. Now, that's not saving grace, but nonetheless, it enables somebody to respond positively of their own free choice to the gospel. So what Wesleyans do not believe is that some persons were predestined before the foundation of the universe to be saved, and some were predestined before the foundation of the universe to be lost. They think that's a pretty bad misreading of both Romans 8 and also Ephesians 1. Um, and I would agree with that. I think it is a bad reading of, of both of those things. So uh, from, from an Arminian and Wesleyan point of view, Christ uh, came 
to die for the sins of the world, not just the sins of some group of human beings. God loves the world, and that's why he sent his son in the first place. And um, when we think about uh, the way grace works, grace, uh, there are moments when God's grace works in ways that overwhelm human beings. Of course, that's true. You can see that in the story of Paul on Damascus Road. That's, that's true. However, not all of the time is grace irresistible. Otherwise, there'd be no point in Paul saying things like, stop quenching the spirit, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, you Christians stop sinning. I mean, obviously, grace can be resisted. And that's why we also have apostasy texts in the mm -hmm. New Testament, such as Hebrews 6. And so um, from a, a Wesleyan point of view, obviously, salvation is by grace through faith. That's true. And in particular, the beginning of salvation called justification or the new birth is by grace through faith. That, that's, of course, true. However, after that, there is the whole process of sanctification. And sanctification is a part of salvation because the goal of salvation is full conformity to the image of Christ. So, Actually, in the New Testament, from a Wesleyan point of view, there are three tenses to salvation. I have been saved, I am being saved, that's the process of sanctification, and I shall be saved, and that final act doesn't happen until the resurrection, where we are conformed, even in the body, to the image of Christ. So salvation is an ongoing work of God, and uh, according to Paul himself, Christians are called to work out their salvation with fear and trembling as God works in us by the Holy Spirit to will and to do. So sanctification is not a unilateral act of God. We have something to do with it. We can hinder it. We can help it. Uh, we can't cause it. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the causing. But nonetheless, we have to respond to it, and we have to respond to it positively. And, and part of that whole deal is manifesting the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Now, the fruit are given, and the gifts are given, but we have to exercise them. The fruit of the Spirit is about moral character. The gifts of the Spirit are about gifts for various kinds of ministry. So, I mean, that's kind of the overview. Hmm. Now, Within the broad umbrella of Arminianism, yeah. there are a lot of permutations and combinations. For example, in Pentecostal theology, they take speaking in tongues as, as the uh, initial evidence or real proof that somebody is a bona fide born-again Christian. Most Arminians and certainly most Wesleyans would not agree with that particular view. Uh, speaking in tongues is a valid spiritual gift, but it's only one gift amongst many. And it's not the one that's sort of the litmus test of whether you're a bona fide Christian or not. That seems clear enough from the New Testament itself. There are other parts of the larger Wesleyan Arminian umbrella that uh, talk about Christian perfection. And, of course, there's a lot of debate as to what in the world does that mean. What John Wesley meant by that was God's perfect love shed abroad in the human heart. Now, God's love is perfect. That's clear enough. But the result of that is it's affecting a fallen and human being. So it doesn't make them perfect. It's a process of perfecting of them in love. That's what it is. So I, I don't really like, for example, the terminology Christian perfection. I'd mm -hmm. rather talk about sanctification or, you know, the inner work of God's grace in a person's life, which is uh, never ending in this life and goes on until the time we are fully conformed to the image of Christ at the resurrection. Um, but what Wesley was insisting on, which most Wesleyans would agree on, is a dynamic spiritual experience that cleanses us from sin at per some particular point in our life and fills us with the love of God. I have no problems with that. So if people ask me, do you believe in the second blessing? I say yes, and the third blessing, and the fourth blessing, and 
however many blessings God wants to give me in the, in the course of a long life, that's all fine. But none of them are definitive evidence that you are born again. I mean, I, I don't subscribe, and Wesleyans generally don't subscribe to the notion that justification is by faith, but you get spirit baptism later. That's, that's not part of Wesleyan theology. I mean, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 is clear. By one spirit, we were all baptized into the one body of Christ, and from that spirit, we are given nourishment to drink and to, to grow in the Christian life. Well, that happened at the new birth. That happened when we became mm. Christian. That's what Galatians 3 says. It says, Paul asks the Galatians, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? By hearing with faith at the beginning of your Christian experience or by keeping 613 Mosaic, Mosaic commandments? And the answer is obviously A and not B. So uh, the idea that the Holy Spirit comes later is not Wesleyan theology. And, and here's another major point. Hmm. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not merely a power or a force. May the force be with you. It's not <laughs> merely that. Of course, the Holy Spirit has power. The Holy Spirit has force. Of course, that's true. But the Holy, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. And you can no more get the Holy Spirit on the installment plan than you can be a little bit pregnant on the installment plan. Either you are or you're not. So the truth of the matter is that while the Holy Spirit can get more dimensions of your life and can renovate more of the internal being that you are, your mind, your heart, your emotions, your, your thoughts, your behaviors, your will, all of that, uh, you don't get the Holy Spirit on an installment plan, some now, more later. So what's all this language about being filled with the Holy Spirit? In the Old Testament, that simply means a prophet was inspired. At some hmm. moment, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were inspired and they spoke God's word. Hmm. Okay, that's it. It hasn't. It doesn't have to do with the quantity of the spirit they got. It has to do with inspiration. And you know, so we have to be very careful about how we read the language about filling and all of that sort of stuff. For instance, in the book of Acts, because it's not really talking about uh, the idea of getting more of the Holy Spirit, the person. It's talking about being gifted more or being inspired more or having a sense of the, the, the Holy Spirit being li a living presence in your life, any of that sort of stuff. Now, the other thing that is certainly Wesleyan is, is um, a disagreement on, you know, four out of the five letters in TULIP, uh, uh, particularly the perseverance of the saints. Hmm. There's just too many texts in the New Testament about not, not only Christian sinning, but about the possibility of uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit or committing apostasy. One of John Wesley's favorite texts about this was from the pastoral epistles, where Paul is talking about Hymenaeus and one other person who made a shipwreck of their faith. Yeah. Now you can't make shipwreck of something you've never had, says mm -hmm. John Wesley. And he's yep. right. He's not talking about, I mean, what sense would it <clears throat> make for John, for Paul to talk about they made shipwreck of a false faith? No, <laughs> no. He's talking about the faith, the Christian faith that they made shipwreck of. So uh, I, I like to put it this way. You're not eternally secure till you're securely in eternity. Hmm. Short of that, you need to guard your heart and guard your life and monitor your behavior <clears throat> and try to live a life that brings glory to God and uh, increases your understanding of the gospel and increases your ability to ed edify other persons. Um, and, and that's why we have so many ethical warnings in the New Testament, all of which are given to Christians. Now, if it was impossible for a Christian to, <coughs> to seriously sin or even reject Christ, 
we wouldn't need these warnings. We would be simply bulletproof, which we're not. So the truth is, again, that you're not eternally secure till you're securely in eternity. You can have assurance of your salvation. You can trust that God is merciful and kind and cares about you. But at the same time, you have a responsibility to live out the Christian life and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have a responsibility to do that. Hmm. That's something all Arminians share in common. And that's one of the reasons that in Arminian theology, and especially Wesleyan theology, there is a huge emphasis on things like the Sermon on the Mount, which is by and large not a, a theology textbook. It's an ethical textbook, how to behave and how not to behave. That's what it's about. So um, John Wesley talked about both social holiness and spiritual holiness. And, and he said that you need both. Spiritual holiness is the renovating of the heart and mind by the work of the spirit so that you manifest love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, etc. But social holiness has to do with behavior. It has to do with manifesting the fruit of the spirit and doing ministry with the gifts God has given you in a way that glorifies God and edifies other people. That's social holiness. And it includes things like working for justice and working against injustice. Uh, the very last letter that John Wesley wrote was to uh, the man himself, uh, about whose story you, you can watch the movie Amazing Grace, who went to Parliament and finally got passed the legislation to abolish slavery in the British Empire. Oh, Francis Asbury? Uh, no, this is not Francis Asbury. Mm. This is uh, John Newton, who who uh, mm. who uh, who mentored. What is the guy's name? It's not Oglethorpe. I'll remember it in about another five minutes. <laughs> That's the way it works wow. when you're over seventy. But anyway, John Wesley's last letter in 1791 writes to this man who is in Parliament, who is a devout Christian. And John Wesley says, slavery is the most inexorable sum of all villainies. Do everything in your power to get it abolished from the British Empire. And he did. And he did. Wow. So social holiness does have to do with fighting evils in the world by moral means. By moral means. And so, you know, it has to do with issues of conscience. If John Wesley was here today, Certainly, he would be very concerned about um, unborn children being aborted. He'd be mm. very concerned about that kind of issue. No question about it. Uh, he would also be concerned about redefining the meaning of marriage. Mm. He wouldn't have agreed with that at all. In fact, if you read his track, Thoughts on Celibacy, there's only two options for Christians which would be faithfulness in monogamous marriage between a man and a woman or sing celibacy in singleness. That's it. Then, yeah. No, no third, fourth or fifth option. Yeah. That's all. So that, I mean, that's traditional Wesleyan ethics as well. So, you know, that, that gives you a kind of flavor of both the theology and the ethics of Wesleyanism. But um, I want to give you some time to ask some questions. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, the first thing I have is, is, is it kind of accurate to say that Wesley Arminian theology is the soteriology of classical Arminianism, and then when the Wesleyan comes out, that focuses on the practicalities of living that theology out and what that means for the Christian in terms of like sanctification and how they live their life uh, to, you know, in faith? Well, that's part of it, but it, it would not be true to say that there isn't uh, a profound theological component to this. I mean, the required textbook of all Methodist ministers in the 19th century in America was Richard Watson's Institutes, which was the Arminian antidote to Calvin's Institutes. Mm. And it is, it's the whole theological ball of wax, you can name it, the theology of predestination, the theology of atonement, all of that. 
Now, of course, in Wesleyan theology, soteriology is the real heart of the matter because Methodism is an evangelistic religion. It's a religion that focuses on getting people saved and keeping them that way. For sure, that, that's at the heart of the matter. But, but it also it involves the traditional affirmations of the Trinity, of human fallenness, I mean, on and on. It's every Methodist church uh, that is a normal Methodist church recites the Apostles' Creed every week. Um, and so it's not different from orthodoxy from other denominations in regard to most of its theological core in Christology, uh, the doctrine of the spirit, et cetera, you know, uh, the inspiration and authority of the Bible. John Wesley's yeah. perfectly clear about yeah, that. He had a very that. high view of the inspiration and authority of the Bible, no question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something that all Protestants who are, are more conservative or orthodox or evangelical or whatever you want to call them share in common. Now, it is certainly true that there's always been a practical bent to a good part of Methodism. That's an essential part of the Methodist witness, for sure. I kind of want to get into, um, you know, like some of the meat and potatoes for a lot of people. Can you talk about the Wesleyan or the Arminian view of predestination? Because usually people th think of these in terms of, you know, that dichotomy, free will versus predestination, not realizing that Wesleyans or, or Arminians, they also believe in predestination. So can you go over what, that view of the Arminian sure, version? Sure, sure. Um, the basic difference would, first of all, there's a difference between election and salvation. In the New Testament, Christ is God's elect one, the one that God chose to be the context in which people would be saved. If you're in Christ, you're elect. If you're not in Christ, you're not. So the question is, how do you become in Christ? And the answer is by grace, through faith in Jesus. That's how it's done. Christ is the elect one. He was the one God chose from before the foundation of the universe to come and be the savior of the world and to die for the sins of the world. He's the elect one, and we are only elect if we are in Christ. That's the end of that conversation. So there isn't a time when God was sitting up there in heaven and saying, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'm picking these to be saved and these to be lost. That's absolutely not true. What's really interesting when you read Romans 8, for example, is that the language of predestination uh, shows up uh, in regard to those who already love God. Mm -hmm. You remember Romans 8, the end of Romans 8 says, you know, um, God works all things together for good for those who are um, called according to choice or according to purpose. And, and what's interesting about that is, then right after that, we have these verses. We have the Greek word ous, and the antecedent of ous is those who love God. So the following sentence reads as follows. Those who love God, God has destined in advance to be conformed to the image of Christ. Mm. It's not about God choosing people to believe in the first place. It's not about God choosing people to love God in the first place. It's about God working in such a way to ensure that Christians can reach the destination of being fully conformed to Christ. And so later in Romans 8, it says, neither height nor depth, nor powers, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor anything at all in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Now, the only thing that's not in that list is you yourself. You yourself can do that. No set of circumstances, no third party, no third force, no outside anything, not even angels or demons can separate you from the love of God. And that's a very great assurance itself. But what's not included in the list of things that can't separate you from the love of God is you. You are the person who could do it by committing apostasy. And apostasy is a horrible thing. I mean, one of Billy, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm. And uh, one of Billy Graham's 
uh, early co-ministers as his crusades began in the, the 40s and into the 50s and 60s. Very uh, good, close friend of his, very devout Christian, S uh, somewhere along the line started having serious doubts about the gospel or the truthfulness of scripture or the salvation that's available through Christ. And eventually he ended up agnostic about all that, quit the ministry, um, and died a pretty unhappy man in, in Canada. Uh, he, he finally rejected the gospel, having believed it for decades in his life and having been a minister and preaching the gospel with Billy Graham in the Crusades himself. Wow. Hmm. I mean, that, that's a classic example of things go, go wrong after they've gone right. He, he was a very talented preacher. He had all kinds of gifts of the spirit, et cetera, and things went terribly wrong, and he made shipwreck of his faith. So predestination has to do, first of all, with God's plan and God's desire that those who love God will be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, one of the more interesting things about this is that when you turn the page to Romans 9, and mm. Paul talks about vessels of mercy as opposed to vessels of wrath, the Greek is different for those two phrases. The vessels of mercy have been prepared for, for beforehand for a good ending, glory, by God. That's what the work of God in the life of a saved person is doing. But the next phrase, vessels of wrath, says, who have prepared themselves for destruction. There's a big difference between those two. Hmm. In one case, God has been preparing a group of people for final salvation. In the other case, there are those vessels who are busily preparing themselves for going to hell in a handbasket. And that's not a good thing to do, to say the least. Both are vessels. Both vessels made by God, but what determines their destiny is, uh, in the case of the Christian, not only the Christian, but also the work of God, especially the work of God. But in the case of the other person, they have determined themselves to not want to be part of that. Hmm. Hell is the place where God says, okay, have it your way. Your will be done. And God allows that to happen because salvation, God is not the Godfather. I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. That's not how God works. That's not how love works. In my book, Who God Is, which is a little primer on the mm -hmm. five major nouns that are predicated of God. God is love. God is light. God is life. God is spirit. God is one. The first of these is God is love. Love cannot be predestined. Love cannot be predetermined. God cannot make you an offer you can't refuse. He wants you to respond freely to his love. He's freely giving his love. We are supposed to freely respond in love. If we are not responding freely, we are not loving by the very definition of agape. We're not. So love itself has to be freely given and freely received and freely responded to. And think for a minute about what are the great commandments that both the Old Testament and Jesus emphasizes. Love Lord Thou God. shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and Jesus adds, and love your enemies. You cannot tell me that that is all predetermined by God and we're simply robots following out the plan. That's just not true. There is a freedom that God gives us by his grace to respond in love. And that's how we are supposed to respond. And that's why morals are actually morals. I mean, if you were all predetermined to behave in a certain way, there is no such thing as virtue. Virtue requires a free choice to behave this way as opposed to that way. 
The mm. New Testament assumes that virtue is possible, that good yeah. could be done. So, so really, so predestination and simplified is this God pre predetermining the destiny of all believers and will they'll go, which is be confirmed to the image of Christ in Romans 8 and Ephesians 1 to the adoption of his sons. Yeah, you know, and one of the more interesting things that most people don't understand is that election in the Old Testament is a corporate thing. Hmm. Israel's elect, that certainly doesn't mean that this particular Israelite is saved or that particular Israelite is saved. It's a choosing of a group of people for a historical purpose, to be a light to the nation. Election in the New Testament is also a corporate thing. It's a group of people who are in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, you're not elect. Now, salvation is not the same thing as election. I mean, Jesus is the elect one, and he didn't need to be saved. Hmm. It has to be something different. We need to be saved. But how does that happen? By grace, through faith in Jesus. That's how that happens. And then, uh, you know, I know this is like, like a big topic, but then, you know, normally the Calvinists will still persist and maybe they'll even go into Romans 9. You know, you, you mentioned that just a little bit, just because, you know, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Yeah. What, you know, how, the, how does this play into Romans 9 then, then as a whole chapter, which seems to be like, one of those bedrocks from Calvinism, they think that we don't have an answer for that. Yeah, well, here's the problem. First of all, foreknowledge is one thing. Predestination is another. God foreknows or knows, simply knows everything. He's omniscient. That's one thing. The fact that God knows it doesn't cause it to happen. Think about it. He knows every last pee pick and sin any human being has ever committed. Did God cause them to sin? If he did, he's the author of evil. He's not the good God that the Bible presents to us. He's certainly not Jesus Christ. Okay? So, no. <laughs> the fact that God knows something in advance doesn't cause it to happen in advance. And, and that's really clear in Romans 9. I mean, pro egno in Romans 9, uh, God foreknew that. Esau would behave this way, and Jacob would behave that way, and et cetera. Yeah, but what God knew didn't cause them to do that. That was their own choice. So foreknowledge is one thing. Predestination is another thing. Gotcha. And then, uh, you know, uh, what are the, some of the common objections also that that get, th you know, thrown out toward, towards uh, Arminianism and Wesleyan Arminianism? Um, you know, you know, I'm thinking of one of them, and it's normally, you know, as we talked about total depravity, uh, yep. you know, the objection will be like, oh, men are totally dead. They can't believe. So, so, so how would you respond to that, that objection? Sure. Um, uh, the first thing to be said is we don't agree, one, don't disagree with the idea that human beings are fallen and they can't get up under their own steam. Absolutely, they can't. That's true. Mm -hmm. There is definitely such a thing as the bondage of sin. No question. But then the question becomes, what does God do about that? And the answer is, I mean, Calvin talked about common grace, a grace that restrains sin and allows even non-saved persons to do good things from time to time, right? Mm -hmm. Wesleyans don't talk about common grace. They talk about prevenient grace, the grace that comes before salvation which enables the fallen person, dead in trespasses, to at least say yes to the gospel. Hmm. That's the difference. There's the difference right there. Prevenient grace, saving grace, sanctifying grace, and finally glorification by full conforming to the image of Christ. I have been saved. I am being saved. And then I shall be saved. I mean, remember, I mean, of course, Paul, is, is the great exponent that Calvinists usually appeal to for most of their theology in yeah. regard to these things. And Paul himself in Philippians says, he says, not that I have already obtained, but I press on to the goal of full salvation, of entire holiness, right? Paul says, I haven't yet 
received all that I need to receive from God to be fully conformed to the image of Christ. He's, he's very honest about this. I press on to obtain the goal of final salvation. That's what he says. So, uh, you know, there are inherent problems with Calvinism from start to finish. And now, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, That's all right. Go I was ahead. going to mention, um, I can hear them in my mind, though, and they'll say, well, that's work salvation, though. Of course not, because grace is required every step along the way. Yeah, amen. It's not, it's not a matter of either grace or works. It's about working out your salvation while God is working in you to will Bingo. and to do. Bingo. It's not an either or prop, proposition. Yeah. It's both and. You have something to do with your own sanctification because of both your beliefs and your behavior. Absolutely you do. Otherwise, we wouldn't need warnings about don't grieve the spirit, don't quench the spirit, don't uh, you know, don't commit adultery, etc. We we wouldn't need those warning warnings if they were, uh, if it was impossible for the, a Christian to behave that way. This is Christians behaving badly. Of course, they can do that. That's the truth. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think of that that sermon that John Wesley preached on Philippians two. What Paul says, "Work out your salvation," and and I believe you mentioned it. Like you're you're working out what God is working in. Yes, and God hasn't isn't stopping work. He's going to keep working until the goal is achieved. Mm -hmm. Right now, John Wesley also has a famous sermon about grieving the Holy Spirit, hmm. and and it and it has to do with what happens when a person continually, persistently pursues some serious sin again and again and again. And again, Wesley says, first of all, when you begin going down that path, the Holy Spirit will warn you, don't do this. This is wrong. It's, you shouldn't do this. But what happens increasingly is that your conscience becomes deadened and you're grieving the very work of God's spirit in your life. And then eventually you're quenching the spirit, says Wesley, and that's apostasy. Eventually, the Holy Spirit says, I'm out of here because you're not repenting of your sin. You're you're you have chosen your sin over your savior. Well, uh, when you say like behavior, do you mean how you're responding, whether in faith or unbelief? Like, well, like is that accurate? It, but I also mean uh, your behavior in regard to obeying the commandments of God. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not murder, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, when, by behavior, I mean behavior, not just how you feel about something or what you believe. I mean, how you, which, what is your conduct? What are your ethics? Um, now, of course, all Christians have blind spots. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that, that is obvious. I mean, I know many devout Christians who are and very successful businessmen who see have no problems with greed. <laughs> None. Mm -hmm. They have no problems with living a conspicuous consumption lifestyle. None. That they have no problems with rampant materialism in their life or shopping till they drop. Now John Wesley had some things to say about that. Namely, none of that is Christian. You know, he had a very good sermon about the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now, you know, and, and so there are blind spots in Christians' lives that need to be, uh, you need to call those to attention of those people and tell them they need to repent and change their lifestyle, frankly. That's what they need to do. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things is that God is merciful. He wants us to be a good witness for Jesus Christ. And so he is, he gently, most of the time, will remind us that this kind of behavior does not glorify God. Or he will send somebody, a friend, a neighbor, a minister to us to say, you know, this you need to repent of. This is not you behaving appropriately. You know, and and all the more so if you're a minister. 
No, ministers should be held to the highest kind of account. Yeah, in regard to their behavior. How do you, you know, uh, you know, just to reconcile? Um, how do you reconcile saying that you um, need to do something to, and or like watch your behavior? Would like that be a matter? Like, are you saying that's a matter of like maintaining or keeping your salvation? Because again, like I just hear people, you know, throwing that out there. Like, like one of the objections, they would say, okay, you know, that sounds like work salvation. So, like, how how would you reconcile that? Salvation is the work of God in the soul of a human being. What I do with what God works in my life is my responsibility. I am responsible for my behavior. Absolutely. And I'm answerable to God for it. Absolutely. So this is just nonsense to call that work salvation. In the first place, I wouldn't even care what God thought about my behavior if I thought I could earn my salvation or do my salvation without the grace of God, without the internal working of the Holy Spirit. None of that's true. Of course not. And see, here's the real problem. Calvin and Luther had three solos, solo fide, Solo gratia, etc. Solo scriptura. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a problem with the idea that salvation is only through faith and is only by grace, but that's not all there is to salvation. Since, as clear as a bell, Paul says we are supposed to work out and we are doing the working out of our salvation. So, salvation and those kind of works go together. You shouldn't pit works over against salvation when, in fact, what you're trying to do is work out what God has worked in. That's nonsense. That's absolute nonsense. And none of us could do any of this that's good apart from the grace of God continuing to work in a person's life. Of course not. But the problem is when you start throwing around, bandying around terms like sola gratia, that rules out about half the text of the New Testament, which tell us that God intends for us to work out our salvation by the grace that God is working in us. So salvation is not just God putting you on a conveyor belt and you reach the destination. This is not true. Salvation is also not a self-help program apart mm. from the work of God. It's neither of those two things. Somewhere in between, there is the God who continually works in us and with us to will and to do what he would have us do. And we have some choice about that. We can respond positively or we can respond badly. That's, that's the way it is. Um, and, and there are always moral consequences either way, either way, because God has structured the universe towards to bend towards justice and a moral outcome. Absolutely. Hmm. Uh, now you've been a, mi a minister, it sounds like, for a decent amount of, amount of time. I believe you mentioned you were, you're in the 70, 70th year. You're going on in your yeah, 70s? I'm, I'm 71. Yeah. Now, wow, God bless you. Um, so, you know, obviously it sounds like you, uh, you maintain your Wesleyan the uh, Armenian beliefs. Like, uh, were you ever a Calvinist at one point or were you always just in the Wesleyan faith? No, I'm I'm a cradle Methodist. My mother said my first two words were John Wesley. I kind of doubt that. <laughs> but but I, I have been a Methodist my whole life long. I, I did go to a Calvinist seminary. I went mm. to Gordon Conwell Seminary to hear the other side of the story. And boy, did I hear it. Wow. I had to read all of Calvin. I had to read all of Luther. I had to read all of Hodge and Warfield and Cornelius Van Til and Burkhoff huh. and Burkauer. Jonathan Edwards, I had to read all of that stuff. And what that did for me is further confirm in my own mind as to why I'm a Methodist. Hmm. Because in fact, I don't think at the end of the day, that's the best reading of the Bible. What are some of those motifs of, because, you know, being that you, you know, you know, you studied uh, Calvin and Luther, like, you know, the heavy hitters and you went to a seminary. Talk about like influence to be, you know, be, be Calvinist. 
and everything. So like, what were, you know, what were the, some of the, the motifs that kept you uh, not, not going down that path? Well, because I thought the exegesis was bad. <laughs> the interpretation of, of the scriptures was bad. And, and basically what we're really talking about is Catholic theology of an Augustinian kind. If you want to know where Luther, Luther was an Augustinian monk. Hmm. You want to know where Luther and Calvin got these ideas. They got them from St. Augustine. That's where it comes from. And I don't mean Augustine's confessions. Everybody loves that. I mean Augustine's theological tracts. He was an absolute uh, predeterminist, predestinationist. You know, and, and before him, that is not true of most of the church fathers. Read yeah. John Chrysostom, read Basil, I mean, read Origen. I mean, just no, yeah. that's not how they interpreted the Bible. So the idea that this is the biblical theology, well, no, it's a biblical theology that was first Catholic and then Protestant. That's what it is. And if in fact you read the new testament in light of that theology well okay you can come to that conclusion but what you have to do is explain away a lot of texts that don't jive with that conclusion and and that's the real problem there the issue again i mean this is what i hear all the time is oh you're denying god's sovereignty yeah no i'm not the question is how does god exercise his sovereignty mm. Does God exercise his sovereignty in such a way that the only person in the universe that has viable choices that make anything happen is God? No, that's not how he set up the universe. If, if a good God set up the universe like that, there would never be evil or sin. But that's not how he set up the universe. How he set up the universe was with other sentient beings, whether they're angels or human beings, that have a measure of freedom of choice. That's how he set it up. That's the way the universe was set up in the first place by God. Hmm. It wasn't set up to predetermine everything from before the foundation of the universe. That's just not true. And so the issue is not sovereignty as opposed to free will. First of all, there is no such thing as simple free will of sinful human beings. What John Wesley says is there is grace enabled will of sinful human beings. That's a difference, right? It's not free will versus predetermination. It's grace enabled will versus predetermination. And the Bible favors grace enabled will as an interpretation of how things happen. Hmm. You, uh, you said you're you're a credo Methodist, so so believers baptism you hold to? Nope. Oh, no, I don't. I believe anybody should be baptized. Including oh, okay. Well, uh, what was it that, uh, that you classified yourself as? Um, I thought you used the word. Credo. I said uh, Apostles' Creed. We, oh, Apostles' we, Creed. We gotcha, all okay. affirm the Apostles' Creed. Yeah. Gotcha. And of course, that we share with Catholic and Orthodox folks. We say the Apostles' Creed. We say the Nicene Creed. Uh, we we agree that those are fundamental things that all Christians should affirm. Okay. Can people, um, you know, I, I saw some of your videos on on seed beds. Like, are you still affiliated with that ministry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Seed bed is an arm of uh, Asbury Seminary. Oh, okay. Great. Perfect. Awesome. Want to give us um, any final words words of encouragement before you know we you know we uh, send send off? Sure. The main thing I would like to say is that God really does love the world, and because God loves the world, He sent His only begotten Son, so that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the plan of salvation. Jesus came for everyone. He died for everyone. The reason not everyone is saved is because some have rejected the gospel. It's that simple. And that's the real gospel message. I mean, if you doubt that that's the message, 
Read the first five verses of Romans 9. Read Paul's anxiety attack that he has over the fact that the majority of Jews he shared Jesus with have not accepted Jesus. He says, I would wish I could be accursed by God if they would just receive the gospel. But he knows perfectly well that they have to freely receive and embrace the gospel by grace through faith. There is an element of them freely accepting it, and that is essential to salvation. Amen. Well, thank yeah, thank you for joining us, you know, and explaining, you know, the, uh, this theology. And, uh, you, you know, if, if, if everybody's out there, you know, if you like this video, you can like, share, and subscribe to Method Ministries. That would be great. Until next time, uh, you know, we'll see you around.